You are now listening to United 96 Podcast on the RFK Refugees Podcast Network. Longtime listeners of the show will know that if you hear my voice before the show actually starts and I'm not reading an ad, that means we made a boo boo when we were recording. So that's what this is. Uh, you'll notice that I'm very quiet for the first 30 minutes of this episode, uh, and then you'll notice that we go away for a second, and then I'm very loud. Uh, sorry, I think a, a wire got unplugged and I tried to go under my desk with one arm and, and fix it during the show and it didn't work out. But, you know, we fix it, we're back, enjoy the show, uh, the insights are good even if they sound weird. Vamos. And welcome in, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, to United 96 here on the RFU Refugees Podcast Network. Ted here, John here, here to break down another fantastic week. In D.C. soccer, okay week in D.C. soccer. Yeah, not I think. so bad. Not yeah, so bad. not so bad. Now, it's certainly better than what we started. I feel like I feel like things are better. First, John, how you doing, man? How was your weekend? Horrible, Ted. I Oof. think one day I'm going to finally <laughs> tell you that I have a good weekend, but not this weekend. I got to listen. If any of you, this is good. if you have if you have a kid already, you know this. Like they bring they are typhoid Mary. They bring home the bad bugs from from daycare or school. But I don't think I've had a stomach flu like that. I maybe ever in my life. It was it was truly miserable. And I'm just now, three days later, four days later, finally feeling like a human. So yeah. I'm glad that it worked out on podcast time that I could <laughs> this is like my return to like humanity. So hello everybody. I'm back from <laughs> the dead. How about you, Ted? I, I better, did a better I, weekend than mine, I am sure. Uh mine was busy. I was I refereed all weekend and um, I'll trade you. I'll had trade a U thirteen <laughs> game where I had to give out uh, five yellow cards, which was a lot of fun. Um, how'd that, that work? Let's talk, let's, let's get into that. For a <laughs> how'd that work? Uh, you got yeah. to, we got a team. It was the Jeff, Jeff, it's the Jefferson cup, which if you're not familiar with Richmond, big, big, um, uh, big youth tournament. Um, and this was a, a, I got assigned the, I think the higher level of the game, certainly a lot of skill out there. And there was one team, uh, from I, one of the Carolinas, they were called Carolina velocity. I think they are either North Carolina or South Carolina. Um, and they, Really wanted to play t- rough and tumble. Um, <laughs> and then uh, the other team, which was from Toronto, interestingly enough, not not Toronto FC, some other some other club in Toronto, very skilled, uh, but then also tried to time waste the entire time. So what was the age group of this? 13. Man, it was Is intense. Normal? Yeah. I mean, the, you get in some of these intense level tournaments. Trust me, it can get. I believe uh, it can get very intense, especially w- when you get to some of the upper level stuff. So, yeah, that was a that was a fun game. I I thought was I being too harsh, and another one of the upgrades like, no, you were fine. <laughs> when a guy they slides, just, when when, when just... a third when a kid slide tackles and um rolls a guy's rolls a kid's ankle uh so much that he has to be like limp off the field. Um, that's the kind of stuff I was dealing with. And then uh an adult league game with uh I was the AR and there was uh two red cards and uh four five six yellows. So fun times. And guys the arguing time change. The vibes were off this <laughs> the possibly vibes. on. So su- that was Sunday. So possibly. Um, but yeah, fun. The, the adult league was not was not atypical, um, especially when you guys don't know what a denial of an obvious goal scoring opportunity is or the most fun. The most interesting thing at all, which is which was uh, apparently you cannot be offside if the ball is played from your own half, regardless of where the other guy is. And I, that just blew my mind. That I was like, I was like what, why do you think that's true? It doesn't <laughs> matter that the. Doesn't matter. Anyway, like, sometimes, sometimes like I think slam- those guys are messing with me. I They're, think they are. I think they are playing like slam ball rules or like uh, beach roller hockey rules on the offside. <laughs> oh like, well, you see, if you take the ball around the ramp around the goal, you can you can you can score from back there if you want. Uh, it's fun though. It was a fun time. It was a good weekend. I, I got a lot of exercise, relaxed, watched DC, pull off a one one draw. So it's only much better. And, and I have to say, I, t- I talked to my parents. I said, "Oh yeah, John's been sick all week." He says, "Oh, is their kid in daycare now?" And I said, "I think so." <laughs> it's like, "Yep, that like explains that. it." <laughs> Yep. <laughs> uh all right let's let's get into it uh let's talk uh dc united orlando one one draw up, oh sorry before, first sorry no 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 but i think oh, this is just something we should do we haven't done this well uh at the beginning of the show instead of the end uh hey thanks for uh watching and listening to us every week and uh, if you like us uh could you please uh rate and review us on itunes or google Podcasts or spotify particularly spotify i don't think you have to write a review you can just hit the numbers of stars so just throw some fives on there if you like us. And if you're watching us in the live show, which a few of you do, and we appreciate it, consider subscribing to us on Twitch, which throws us a little bit of money, uh, makes it worth our while to show our beautiful faces, particularly after maybe we've had 48 hours of 
<laughs> of not self care. So maybe you don't want to be on camera, but <laughs> here we are. So just think about that, and and now let's get to the show. Let's get to it. Let's talk. Uh, let's talk DC United. Let's talk Orlando. Um, one one draw. A uh, an interesting result, I think. I mean, I, th- I think everybody was sort of predicting that this would not be a normal game. Fact, DC and Orlando, score, by the way. We, What's that? We had the we had the score. On. I don't know if we. You <laughs> did. <tweeted> yeah, you <laughs> I, tweeted the I score. Tweeted so there's that. Yeah, one one game. Um, goal from Chris Durkin. A goal from some guy from Orlando, which I will not look up. But all I know is Steve Birnbaum. Maybe at fault for that goal. Let Let's talk about. Let, let's start before we get into the to the goals. I guess let's talk about. I guess the first half for DC, which I think Wayne Rooney alluded to, uh, was a really good half from DC, and I tend to agree with him. Um, Can we talk about the line, the starting lineup first? Yep, yeah, sure. Let's go get into that. Uh, Ted Cudi Biedro gets the start, which is yep. something that Ted has been. So we had a few, if you, you know, if you're a long time listener, more than a week, uh, you know, that we talked about this last week is like, uh, is it time for Ted Cudi Biedro to start? And I said, ah, you know, I don't know if we should start him from the, the beginning of the game. It's a lot of pressure for a young player and I don't want to have the good vibe start. And Ted's like, no, man, it's time. Let's do it. And, uh, it was right because Nigel Bertha was not, had a knock. So it was by, by, by a simple rule of attrition, it was certainly time for Ted to come on the field. And, and also, uh, go ahead. well, the performance from Ted, I think it was really impressive. We'll get into that. But apparently he was also sick. Um, so he caught a little bit, I guess, of what you had. Hopefully not what game. you had. <laughs> it was, yeah, if it was, then there, he wasn't out there. Not, <laughs> I mean, he's, he's he's 20 years old, man. Doesn't I mean, matter. some, some kids matter. can fight through a lot. You but... gotta have, no, I don't want to get into it. I was going to make a joke <laughs> at my own. At my own at my own expense, I'm not going to. Uh, we also said that uh, Ruan would probably start. We didn't know that Andy Nahar had a knock. It was more we just thought it's probably time to give him a start, considering mm-hmm. this is his former team. Uh, he got a start. Uh, I'm trying to think if there was any. There, are, I don't think there were any other surprises in the lineup. Uh, if I'm correct, now Derek Williams quick. getting the start. I guess the, the surprise for me was Victor Paulson. I guess. Yeah, Rooney, we'll talk about that. Rooney sort of sticking. I think we all alluded that you know if Derek Williams is healthy. Victor Paulson is probably out there and uh, he was not um, Rooney deciding to stick, um, stick with uh, the, the midfield, the three midfield, the three midfielders that he has sort of stuck with um, Matthias click, uh, Russell Knauss and Chris Durkin. Um, and that was after Russell Knauss got turned uh, into a, into a Tasmanian devil for a goal the previous game. So, yeah, it was interesting. And it, Russell Knauss responded, I think with a good game. And I think uh, Rooney, um, Rooney mentioned that in his post game show. Interesting. What What are your thoughts? I guess on you know, do we read anything into this? Is this just a you know he, these guys have played well together? They've looked okay. Maybe it's uh you know may, maybe it's part of that, or do you think this is start a start of a larger thing? And and how does someone like Victor Paulson, who's kind of brought in here, uh, has really assumed the leadership role? You certainly don't want to lose that. He seems like he's very much a guy out on the field being a leader being an organizer, you know, building guys up, um, which is something you need, uh, you know, w- is he okay with doing it from the bench? I think is going to be a big question. So what want to get I your bet, thoughts. I bet not. I, and I also think that Mateus click who was not here when he was brought in could probably fulfill that role if need be. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, you build a team with an idea in mind, but then things change and players leave and Ravel Morrison is a player that you don't even roster yet is still on your set. Things happen that you don't expect. Right. Mm-hmm. So I think that last year, Victor Paulson made a lot of sense. And I think this year he maybe makes a little bit less sense. He would, he'd make more sense if his, if his positional versatility were real and not imagined, which is what it appears to be. Cause he's not a center back that that's not going to happen No. So that means he's got one place on the field that he can really excel. And unfortunately that is the spot and the field in which we are the most deep with players that, should all be starting and so, getting deeper, which we'll get into that in a, in a little yep. bit. So um, I, I, I think it's entirely possible that you see this team try to move on from him in the summer window. Um, and then you try to find leadership in other places, nothing against him. I think it's just a matter of like, this is how it's shaken out. They didn't, I don't think they definitely did not intend or were not planning a Mateus click edition in the following year. And that sort of midfield pivot player, uh, and also having a healthy canals, which I, that's stupid to even say out loud. <laughs> I've now jinxed him. <laughs> I've now definitely jinxed him. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I think it's entirely possible that he is not the fit that he was when he was signed. And you might, from a roster flexibility slash salary cap specific, you might run a, you might see him move in the summer. 
We'll see. And I think he still has a role to play. There's a lot of games that are going to be coming up for this team. You've got Open Cup, obviously League's Cup. So I, I still think he has something to say. I think you could see the team still hold on to him. You know, as long as he is okay in that maybe reserved role, maybe he recognizes that, you know, those guys have been performing better, um, better than him. And, you know, DC's center back is also very, very thin. So he might get thrown right back into that center back role. So funny you say that, though. Like I, I was looking at the bench before the game started. I was like, oh, Hayden Sargis is alive and yeah. he's, he's here. So the bench was the bench. The unused substitutes for the game were Alex Bono, obviously, but Donovan Pines, Hayden Sargis. Jacob Green, Matt, Mattia Kamboni, and Victor Paulson. So a million defenders. So they're, they're all, I mean, we have defenders. It's just not starting, not generally every game starter like depth. It's just like mm-hmm. we got some young kids we can throw out there. There's not a lot of faith. The The attacking options are still so thin. With one or two injuries, mm-hmm. it's it gets real thin real fast. Christian Fletcher, Yemil Assad, and Jackson Hopkins – that's that's it. That the, the the cupboard is bare after that. So it's, you know, I, as they're continuing to look for players, which we'll talk about, like an attacking threat would be one, would be one you'd want to have either as a backup striker or, and I, the winger is what they they need a starting caliber winger most likely, and we could talk about Pedro Santos here in a second, um, or you know a wide a wide midfielder player, but uh, other than that, it's it's a real it's a real thin situation on the bench with any kind of injury at all. Yeah. All right, let's um let's get into the game a little bit. Uh, so, like I said, first half I think was pretty much all DC United uh, most of the most of the way. Of course, Orlando also ro- rotating guys because they had the Champions League against Tigres. That's certainly probably in the front of their mind. Um, so, an opportunity I think for DC, and I think I think we got to talk about why well, I think we're okay with the result. Um, I think we have to acknowledge that this was a little bit of a missed opportunity at home against a team that has a much bigger match on their mind this week. Um, This was an opportunity to go out, pick up three points. Um, You look at the schedule and you look at sort of, and I I know we're early on, but I kind of took a look at the standings and like, all right, where, where is kind of where this is kind of everybody, where is everybody starting? You're starting to see maybe the beginnings of, of a, um, of where the formation is. And where the teams are falling sort of in the in the standings. And I, I got to say that some of the teams that are below us right now, I think, could potentially be better than what they're showing. Um, and some of the teams, I'm not really seeing anybody above us that I think they're overperforming. They'll drop down. Um, so I think this we have to look at this as a missed opportunity um, to, to pick up three points. It's early, but it, it, it is it is a missed opportunity. Um I guess let's let's get to the. I want to talk about the main. I guess the the main point of discussion. I guess where I'm where I'm a little conflicted is uh, Christian Benteke. I want to talk about him. Elephant in the room. It's he. Uh, he is brought in here to do to do one thing, and that is to score goals. Um, and so far he has one goal, which was which was nice. Uh, he got a PK, which again I, I have. I'm sort of a, a PK opportunity that was overturned by VAR. I should say rightfully, rightfully. Um, and I almost saw that, and I said. Kind of glad maybe he didn't take that because his penalties have not been his favorite. His if favorite thing. That, if he missed that like that, I think that's not <laughs> catastrophic because he's got <laughs> he's got he's got a bit more of a record than some other. You know, I've seen. You know, we have DC United fans have seen a DP that's mm-hmm. struggling to score, take the ball, and then not score the penalty. That's like a backbreaker for someone on low on confidence. So yeah. you're right. <laughs> I don't think he's low on confidence necessarily though. But you know, we, we talk about Christian Benteke and. You know, I, I look out there on the field, and, and I guess the first thing that comes to mind for me is this team would undoubtedly be worse, undoubtedly be worse if he was not out there on the field. His hold-up play, again, is excellent. I know that's a dirty word amongst DC fans. It um, is, though. It's fantastic. <laughs> no, not the word. His his hold-up play. Oh, it's fantastic, it, yes. It is, it is, it is, a, it is an elite-level skill. It is in the top tier of MLS right now automatically. When, when that ball goes over the top regardless of what defenders he is facing, he is going to pr- most likely win that ball. Yep. And that's important. And I think once this team gets, you know, Taxi Fundus healthy, it'll be something interesting it, it'll be something uh something potentially game changing once he has a sort of a guy that can sort of anticipate that and run onto that. Um and you know, I will say his his effort is better. He's finding himself in those positions. He is getting maybe one or two quality chances every single game, which is something we certainly did not see last year. So he's doing all the right things to get himself in the positions where he can put the ball in the back of the net. That being said, he's only put the ball in the back of (laughs) of the net once. 
So I'm conflicted on him because, and I think a lot of fans are kind of, some are saying, oh, I'm done with him. It's been a bust. Get him out of here. And I'm like, I- I'm not ready to throw the throw the baby out with the bathwater just yet on, on Christian Menteke. I-, I think he still has a bit more to offer. I think he could potentially uh, find a goal scoring form with goal scoring. I think it's all about confidence. Um, let's talk his chance. Do you think, I guess there was some debate as to, you know, did he, was it a, a good save from uh, Pedro Galese or a bad miss, a potentially missed opportunity for Benteke? Where do you fall on that? I'm curious. Oh, John, your audio dropped. Uh, how about now? Yes, you're good. <laughs> I was going to say the answer to that is yes. Uh, it was both. It was both of those things. It was more the miss uh, than than anything else. Uh, it was it was more a a con- thing he should have converted and didn't. I think. Personally. Yeah. What, do you think it was a better save? You know, I think he hits it low. I think he hits it hard. I think it is. <laughs> uh, and we're back. Welcome back, in, folks. <laughs> <laughs> United 96 on their career refugees podcast network You're listening to the live stream this will probably all be stitched together on the podcast so you will never know the difference John uh, yeah let's talk about that uh, I don't know what happened I was recording everyone was saying I can't hear you and the reason for that was uh, my microphone was not plugged into my computer at all so uh, I had to get underneath my desk and pull wires out with one arm laying on my back so yeah fun times radical all right uh, you know what? let's just start over um Christian Benteke. Christian Benteke. <laughs> Hi, Christian Benteke. <laughs> Let's start that old segment. So Christian Benteke, um, obviously generating uh, generating chances. I think he's moving well, but he hasn't put the ball in the back of the net. Um, John, what are your thoughts? Is, is, am I wrong in, I guess, maybe thinking that we need to give him more time? Has he had enough time? Oh, he's where, definitely where not like? had enough time. I don't – I mean, I, he still has – he still has no – uh, actual wingers serving the ball. He's getting chances, so the quality of the service is pretty good. Um, a, you're contracted to this guy for a couple more years. B, no one better is going to walk in the door. Yeah. C, there's no back. So really, it doesn't matter if you're happy with it. We all have to make peace with our own gods about the fact that Christian Benteke is going to get nine chances to score a game, and he might score one of them. And right now, he's not scoring. He's, he's, he's not feeling the... Uh, one one would be great. Yeah, again, I think I think he the fact that he's getting the opportunities is an improvement over last season when he was not getting those opportunities. So i i have i have a I have a hope. I have a hope that he finally you know he he gets enough of those chances. Pedro Glesse still made I think some really nice saves in this game. I think kept uh, you know kept Orlando alive. I think maybe a little bit of a lesser keeper lets that shot in. Um, so I don't think it was great placement. Um, I don't think it was fantastic placement and just an amazing save by Galese. I think it was certainly savable. Um, but I, you know, I, I think he's still getting in those opportunities. He looks engaged. He looks invested. Um, I think all of those are positive things for him moving forward. And I think if he, you know, if he gets hot, I think he'll find the right, find the right streak. Um, we, we talked a little bit about, um, about uh Tech Q Pietro again playing playing with an illness, uh, which was which was made it more incredible. I thought he took there were moments where he could not find the game sort of early on. I don't think he was really much of a factor. Um and then he kind of started to get space, get more opportunities. The team started to find him a bit more. And, you know, he has probably the second best chance of the game, um, sort of a low shot that Gillespie gets the save to. Um I don't think I, I don't I think I think Ted does as battle well as you could have expected with that, a low, hard shot. Um, that's always mm-hmm. what you want to look for. Um, and again, I think maybe a lesser keeper, that that's a goal in DC United or 2-0 up. Um, any, any thoughts on Ted Pietro and, and how he looked? Yeah, man. For uh, We said for already the fact that he was sick. This was this Jordan game. Mm-hmm. Uh, he could have it could, he could have scored there in that opportunity that you just cited. He was, it's, we, it was good that we found out later that he was sick because like you said, he started to heat up right as they took him out. And I think... You know, usually the way that works is the coach would be like, "Hey, you're coming off in the 60th minute. Give me all you got there at the in the last in the last five or ten. Give me what you can give me." Uh, and then he did. So the challenge was, uh, you know, the drop off after uh, Yamil Assad came on was, I think, pretty high, right? Yamil Yamil Assad not match fit. He's not. Uh, beyond match fit, he doesn't have the confidence. We saw that not in this game, but in the Columbus game, 
where he, uh, you know, gave up chances to shoot or shot directly at the keeper in a very, very tame way. He's just not dangerous right now. Mm -hmm. So Ted, Ted is dangerous right now when he's on the field. So that's a, it was a, it was a notable drop off. But like I talked about before looking at the bench, where else were they going to go? There was not a lot of opportunities. It is wild that one Nigel Bertha injury away from like, Oh, we're just screwed. (laughs) We don't have any offensive. We don't have any offensive options now. Sorry. Yeah, it's certainly, um, and I think it sort of it sort of undersells, I guess, why why this team traded Miguel Berry. Um, you know, maybe yeah. in previous years they say, well, you know, maybe we have some offers, but I think we'll hold on to him. I think they said, you know what? Maybe they went, you know, they went to Wayne. They had a, a group meeting that said, you know, hey, we got this offer from Miguel Berry. Do we trust Ted Kudu Pietro, Jackson Hopkins, or Clifton Fletcher to be ready? And I think you know Wayne came out of that and said, yeah, I think I think Ted Kudu Pietro is ready. I, I think the way Ted Kudu Pietro performed in preseason, I think maybe maybe started to force their hand a little bit where they said, okay, you know, he can be that sort of that number three striker. We'll go find somebody else. We'll go find maybe a more comparable attacking talent, but I think, you know, we can get by with take Cudi Pietro. So, um, Pedro Santos, by the way, Miguel, by the way, Miguel Barry is starting, uh, every game currently for Atlanta United (laughs) that will change, uh, as they, their DP that they brought in to replace Joseph Martinez gets fit is, is Giacomacus. Uh, but he's now coming in sort of second half. I think Miguel Berry's days are numbered, even though Atlanta is uh, offensively very dangerous right now. I'm glad we don't play them next week. Yeah. Yeah, very much so. We get them later in the month when the, when the Greg striker will be, maybe they'll be tired. Maybe, <laughs> maybe <laughs> too many goals scored. <laughs> They're bored of it. Maybe. Um, Let's uh let's talk about Pedro Santos. This is a guy. Maybe I was a little bit critical of, and then I kind of watched a little bit of the replay. Um, he he was certainly very active. He was sort of playing a new role. He was kind of, it, it was sort of interesting because I think we all saw the lineup and we thought, okay, so it'll be Ted Cudi Pietro kind of playing off of Christian Benteke. And that was sort of the case, but it was more Ted Cudi Pietro playing in Pedro Santos's left spot with Pedro Santos kind of playing up as an attacker. Um, and, you know, for, you know, at 34 years old, the dude played a full 90 minutes and ran and and was the guy who played the ball to Durkin on the goal. A guy maybe I was a little bit critical of. I, I thought, you know, first watch, he didn't have a good game. Second watch, I started to sort of say, OK, let me watch. There's other people saying, well, no, he looked he looked really good. And then I said, OK, well, let me second watch. Let me just focus on him. And also focus on Matias Click. We'll get to in a minute. Um, and I thought he was actually he was excellent. Um, I thought he played really well and mm. and and sort of supplied the ball. I think he played and we'll get to maybe Matias click. It was sort of a, it was not a role where he had particular moments where you pointed out and said, wow, what a great moment. It was very much sort of playing off, uh, playing off Benteke sort of dropping into, to maybe cover, maybe try to pick up the ball to, for recycling. Um, but it, overall I thought he had a, a pretty good game. Um, all things considered, maybe you had a different opinion. Yeah, my my original my thoughts were your original ones. Yeah, and I'm now looking at his his foot mob score, and he was good comparatively to to Mateus Click, who we we're just about to talk about. Uh, they had a lot. Of fam- I mean, the assist obviously helps that. But mm-hmm. yeah, I, I thought I, my my first watch while I was just trying to absorb the game. I haven't I haven't watched it a second time yet. I thought that he underperformed, but good to know that that was wrong. Yeah, <laughs> stat wise, I mean, again, it, it wasn't a performance. I guess that you. St- like there were better than Columbus, yeah. I think, right? We could definitely say that. Definitely, definitely. Um, and I think I think where he played impacted the next guy we'll talk about, which is Matias Click. Um, I still will say did not have a strong game offensively, but I did notice he was definitely playing further back. Um, it, because of where I think Pedro Santos was playing, I think he kind of occupied the role that we would expect Matias Click to occupy, kind of that linker guy who's gonna carry the ball forward. I think he was asked to sort of play a little bit further back. Um, and I thought, you know, I, again, I, I think he, he m- had an off game. I think he would maybe say that. Um, certainly I think his first two performances were much, much stronger. Um, but you know, I, I overall, I'm, I'm not reading too much into it. Um, any, any thoughts that you agree with that on Mateus click or any thoughts about that? No, I think that's right. I think that you're going to have, you're going to have some games. The first two games, everyone said like, Oh, how about that? A premier league starter is good in MLS. And that was sort of like taken for granted that he was going to give you a nine out of 10 every week. Probably not realistic. I think no matter what, Mm -hmm. I think he even sort of said in sort of his, uh, no, that was previous week, but he, I I think everyone who can watch still sees the talent. It was just like you said, he was put in a different position the way the game, the game state went. He wasn't really able to be on the same front foot and, uh, you know, intercept as many passes. They also had more of the Mm -hmm. ball. 
cool. It's it's a different it's a different scenario than the game in which he scored in the first game or in Columbus. Yeah, less transition, which I think is where he actually shows a lot of his strength is when the ball is moving forward. He's in transition. He's able to use his skills to kind of dribble, progress the ball forward. I think that's where you see him um, see him at his best, which is good because that's the default. That's what DC United wants to be doing. Mm -hmm. And it is interesting in the last two games, they've had more of the ball than their opponents and haven't taken three points in either one. Obviously, they were able to draw this one, but that came out of nothing from Chris Durfin on. It could have that could have easily been no points at all. Yeah. I think that that uh, as evidenced by when the goal came and how it came about, like uh, the fact that, I mean, you can isolate the fact that Christian Benteke was a chance black hole, but other than that, it wasn't happening. So um, I think that it'll be interesting to see how teams continue to face the United United. Do they say, we'll give them the ball. Like, that's fine. I, I think, I think we, I think it's a lot to do with how this team handles transition defense. And the answer is generally not very well. We saw that in Columbus. Uh, and also now I'm thinking the tide may have turned with having two actual center backs in the center of defense. I think that will probably uh, be beneficial going forward. That will hopefully lend to more organization in those scenarios where uh, they're not able to, you know, really be calm. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, I guess the next guy, Russell Canals, I think we said we already kind of talked about earlier, had sort of a bounce back game for him. Um, I thought he was excellent sort of being that being that kind of destroyer out there in the center defense, you know, breaking up plays, recovering the ball. Um, I I don't think there's much more to say. I think he had an excellent Wayne Rooney said he had an excellent game and I think he's right. Um, for sure. If Wayne says it, we agree. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, but this time we do. Yeah. Let's get to, um, let's get to, I I don't really have much for, for, uh, Jazzy. I I don't really have much for him. Um, I think he was, he was solid. Um, Ruhan, I think was the one I want to maybe, Zero in on yeah. it. Unless you have you anything, you, you were having some Twitter opinions on that. So yeah, man. I mean, is he? He's definitely more. So he brings an interesting aspect in that he is very much an out and out wing back. He is going to push forward. He's going to go down the right side, and he's going to try to cross. Now I look back at it, and he actually had two pretty decent crosses. Got the ball into a dangerous position. He also had one really, really awful cross. Um, so I think we we saw that kind of early on and then he had a couple nice crosses. And so maybe I said, OK, well, maybe it's 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 a little bit hit or miss with him. Maybe that gets, and he had a field goal. Yeah. And then he had a then he had a <laughs> even a Dave Johnson called it a field goal for the de- the, the defenders, which I appreciated. <laughs> yeah, um, it, it was certainly not a. Yeah, it, it was an un, I thought his defensive I thought defensively he was a little bit more of an imposing figure than Andy Nahar. Um, Andy Nahar is going to sort of contain players. He's going to use his sort of quick feet to kind of stay in front of a guy and try to keep them, you know, relatively try, try to make it harder for them. Um, Ruan's going to be the guy that's going to go in for the tackle and try to win the ball. And I thought he made a couple of nice, really defensive plays. So they, they both sort of bring a different, different aspect. You know, Andy Nahar is a, is going to try to dribble and move the ball sort of cut inside. Um, I think we've, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about Chris Durkin coming up because I, I want to save him for the goal. Um, <laughs> but, you know, overall, I think it was a fine performance. But, you know, again, I, I just feel like y- you really do miss Andy. I think right now Andy is the starter just in what he brings to this team and, and how he looks. So hopefully his injury is not bad. But I, I think it is it is positive to see that the team does have some depth there, that when Andy does get hurt, I feel like we can we can get by. With with Ruan, unless unless Ruan gets hurt, true. <laughs> but I mean, I mean, that's probably fair of most teams. Is oh, yeah. no one's three deep. Uh, SC Lad says ultimately, though, how much did we miss Nahar? Um, a lot. I would say a lot. And also, if you remember the time period when Bill Hamid was there, that DC United had no points in games which Bill Hamid did not start. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is there's a there's a I don't want to. We obviously already got one point, but he's a player. That was, I think, super integral in uh, Hernan Lozada's system. Here, he is with the depth, having sort of a like, not necessarily like for like, but like a player that is at least a right back in trade and and and, and knows how to do it. I think that at least if he gets injured again, which we know will happen in some way or fashion, I think we can we can stay afloat. To your point, he he brings an aspect of when he cuts inside, he kind of overloads a lot of the center. He collapses teams and he opens up the wings. He opens up Durkin, you know, maybe for a quick cross back. If he can't find the situation, he opens up maybe a switch uh, because he can kind of cut in and kind of collapse the teams in, into the middle. So 
Um, I, I think he, he's a guy I, I don't think we'll see we'll see lose his starting job over this. I don't think he lost his starting job. Um, injuries might do that to him, but I, I don't I don't foresee any issues um, with him starting starting the rest of the year. Uh, center back pairing. We finally have our first game with two natural center backs. Two natural center backs and two and not a 16-year-old also playing center back. So uh, Derek Williams, um, Steve Birnbaum out there. Obviously, like we have to talk about Steve Birnbaum on the goal. He gets beat. I think there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. He loses track uh, of the Orlando attacker, uh, tries to make a play on it, nearly hurts himself. Hopefully that's not a big issue. Yeah, it was an ACL <laughs> for a second there. Yeah. Insult to, insult to injury for sure, almost. Yeah, ho- hopefully nothing happens there. I mean... Like people post like the stats, you know, people post the numbers and people post the, you know, all the, all the things about Steve Birnbaum and say, well, you know, look at this, you know, he's in the top percentile in one headers and tackles and, and all these other things. What is it like? What is it about him, though, that it seems like every goal this year you look at it and you say, oh, that's Birnbaum's man. He should be marking. It's like it's moments that I feel like is missing. I don't really know what to make of it. You know who it reminds me of? And it's kind of funny is it reminds me of Donovan Pines and that he, uh, there will be moments where he will he'll look great until he looks horrible. And Steve Birnbaum will look great until something happened and a goal results and you'll find him on the ground or you'll yeah. find him spun the wrong direction. And it's a small sample size here. We're looking at three games and he was only in he's only started two of them. So what's what's hold the rush of judgment for a little bit and give him another chance here, a couple more chances. Uh, and again, similar to Benteke, uh, there is not another MLS starting center back caliber guy walking in the door here in the next week. Mm-hmm. So uh, live with it until July at the very latest or earliest. But it is funny how he keeps finding himself in these situations. Um, and maybe I don't know if he's being targeted. I don't know if it's just a matter of this is the way the goals are presenting. They're they're not they're not long shots. They're not, you know. It's not off of course. It's it's open play that just happens. There's a defensive breakdown or something. I, I don't know. Yeah, but to your point, the stats ain't telling the story uh, uh, as far as the end result. I think. Yeah, it's 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 moments. It's it's moments where he is switched off, and and I don't know if he's. Yeah, I I I, I really don't know. Um, I really don't know what to say about it. I, I think he, you know, skill wise, I think he still has it. Uh, Derek Williams, I thought, you know, again, doesn't get caught on on the goal was excellent in this game. I thought he really had a strong performance. You could see the ability of him to kind of move the ball to make that pass. Um, I think he made a couple of nice defensive plays. Um, yeah, again, I thought he was really good. And uh, Tyler Miller as well playing sweeper keeper, which it very much seems situational. He was not, there was not a lot of sweeper keepering going on um, against, um, against Columbus, but I will say, I thought he looked a lot more comfortable with it and his distribution I think it was mentioned. Um, I think it was mentioned by one uh, one one Twitter person was like, you can see a difference. I mean, as, as much as I love Bill and his ability to keep keep players in games, um, I think you know really, and it also helps when you have Benteke out there. You just lump the ball up in his general area and he'll <laughs> right. win it. But you know his ability to kind of he, he did play the ball out to some other areas, and I think he shows that he has that skill set. And you know, as much as I complain, I'm like, you know, your goal of a goalkeeper should be able to, you know should be able to stop goals first and foremost. And then, then let's worry about, you know, maybe distribution. Um, I can see why some coaches lean to this because, you know, they want a guy who can, you know, maybe give you a moment where the ball's over the top and they think they're going to try to run onto it, but the keepers pushed up enough that, that they can, you can basically clear it before it becomes a problem. Um, so what's, uh, is her name? Kaylin Kyle. Is that her name? The, the, broadcaster MLS Caitlin Caitlin Kyle I don't know uh she was saying that one of DC United's biggest problem was goalkeeper come sort of like on their their preview I was like nope no it is not and <laughs> that's not true we're fine that's he he is to your point the distribution is better uh they are now they are now doing it somewhat on easy mode I think Bill probably would have looked okay uh doing distribution to Benteke uh but uh, you know I'm not uh, he's not made a howler yet. Mm-hmm. He's not really been able to really do is and he's made a couple saves that were decent. It's just not been the game. The few games we can't make those sort of judgments on anybody right now. Uh, right. Except we can make positive judgments on a couple players and there's lots of everybody else that's doing poorly. You gotta, you gotta, the, the jury's out. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's like anything. I think it's a, it's a, 
you're you're getting sort of a first look and like okay. You know, you're kind of I think for this for this for these first three games for DC it's kind of like where where where, where are we standing? Where are we going to stand and are are we is this going to be a season where we're not going to have this all together by may or june if that and then maybe are we looking at another long season or are there things together and i think so far like my early impressions are they're a lot further along than i thought they'd be um they look organized they look again the possession style which i was surprised at how much i usually i don't like it because i'm like you can't play a possession style if unless you have players that are good enough to do it and so far, they seem like they are a team that's, that's that's able to get it down, able to make it work. They are recycling the ball when they when they get a chance. They recover it. They then recycle it very well to sort of create that next opportunity. Um, so they have they have all the pieces, I think, for this to be a successful season. It's just a matter of can they get healthy? Can they get some some more bodies in? Um, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But um, let's get to the goal right. score. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, get to, get to a position where you do not have six central defenders on your bench. <laughs> uh, that will be a that will be a sign. Will be a good like yardstick of improvement. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's talk about let's talk about one of those central defenders, and that is Chris Durkin, who had himself a game uh, getting called out by a pitch pass. You just call him a central defender. Central, sorry, central defensive midfielder is what I meant. Is what I meant to say. <laughs> well, I'm like we need another. We can play. Maybe we can move another player to center back. I I like the spirit I, over I, here. I will hold that he could be a very effective center center defender. In fact, with his he ability to pass, it could be really important. Yep. But he is right now sort of reserved into that into that sort of eight. I think really that eight type. He's really at eight out there he's a guy who's going to push forward and um you know he has i thought had an excellent game um again i think he 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 again is a guy i think there's a lot of players out there that i'm just like man you know he's very effective at what he does sort of getting the ball recycling the ball he is playing out right but and people seem to say oh he's not a winger i'm like yeah he's not that's not what he's being asked to do and we talked about this in the show a lot I think it's great for him that he gets a goal, probably a, a absolutely first class goal, probably the goal of the year so far for DC. Maybe Click has an argument, but I would say considering the I like Durkin's better, yeah, to the position, the outside curler, um, sort of out of nothing. Um, great goal for him. You know, he's he's been kind of called out, and, and I thought um, Jason Anderson on pitch pass kind of brought it up. It's something I can think about. You know, he basically the reason he's out there is because he kind of stays out of Andy's way. He does a good job sort of supporting. He can he can play a ball. You see him sort of ping a ball, um, sort of a long time, and that's something a skill set he's always had. Um, mm-hmm. I think he is starting to put it together in a way that I think is going to be interesting to watch. And and with the player we're bringing in, it raises a question about you know what do you do because he has been so good. Uh, he was good in this game. I think he's starting to build upon it. You know, we've had players now in the central of midfield between Mateus Click, um, Russell Canals, and. Durkin, you got the guy we're going to talk about, Lewis O'Brien, coming in. Where does he fit? So um, I don't know. Any any thoughts on Durkin? Any thoughts on where what he plays or just? No, I mean it's it's just a it's a hat to accident. I don't think people were necessarily uh, thinking that he was going to be such a uh, important part of the offense when mm-hmm. he was when he came back here. I don't think that's what anybody really had in mind. So it's a you know it's a happy it's a happy accident for us. And w- without it, this team is made much worse. And, and, and I think that that that'll be interesting. We'll talk about it right now. What, what are you going to do with this midfield and what does this composition of the midfield do for a team that does not have that, that, that Benteke is, is not really finishing all. Of his You're going to rely on a taxi a lot, I think mm-hmm. in this, in this scenario. Yeah. Taxi. Apparently his, his recovery is going well, which is good to hear. Uh, they're targeting April 1st for him. Uh, let's good. get into probably go ahead. Sorry. I was. I just said good. Yeah, good. <laughs> that's, what I want to, that's what I want to hear. I think the team needs him. Um, yep. Team needs him out there. Uh, despite, I feel like some fans have. Uh, well, we, we talked. We talked about the personal, the, <laughs> the issue, the issue before the regular season. It's it's really hard to. It's really hard. I mean, you, you talk about uh, you focus on him as a player and without thinking about what had happened, and and it's 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 a strange situation with him because I want the team to win, and I know they're better with him out there on the field, but you, you can't. Yeah, maybe that's uh, I want Ted to maybe take his position, but I don't think that's going to happen. Um, let's talk about the guy DC's planning to bring in, and that is uh, Lewis O'Brien. Uh, this was kind of a, a surprise move, I think. Uh, he had been apparently been in talks with TFC. It He's right now in DC, you know, arriving for a medical. Um, the, the story behind why we're getting this guy, this guy was signed by Nottingham Forest um, from West Brom, I believe. 
uh, for 10 million, if I recall correctly, one of the championship teams, um, Huddersfield, Huddersfield, sorry, Huddersfield. And then I think it was a, it was a transfer to Blackburn. I think that ultimately fell through in, in January. Um, and so he was apparently the team was already like envisioning him. It's sort of a, it's sort of, a, it, it reminds me of like a football manager situation when you're like trying to wheel and deal, trying to sell. And then you've got to like not register a guy. Because you don't have, you can't, reg- you have a limited number of players you can register at the January window. You thought this deal was going to go through, it falls apart, you try to appeal it, and then you have to basically say, well, we can't register you because we already brought this guy in to replace you for the year while you're on loan, so you're kind of out of luck. So uh, DC United, I think, taking advantage of, and I think it's kind of the cost, like how does he fit in, a, in an already crowded central midfield? And I think the sort of response was, well, he's available. You know, we're right. we're willing to... He's a good player. People have talked him up as like a really good player. Getting a ten million dollar transfer from essentially we're getting a designated player on loan uh, for the summer, and we'll get into the, the terms of the deal right. and, and kind of how this all works. Um, so I think we're that's get, we're getting a little taste. I think we're that, a little little sprinkle. Yeah, I, I think that's ultimately why we got the deal done in Toronto. Didn't I bet Toronto said we want him for the whole year, and Norwich was like, no, we don't want to do that. We're you like, know, we'll just and, take him for five minutes. Can he just yeah. sit over here for a little while? That's fine. We'll take it. Well, we'll, we'll see, I guess, how that impacts the, the sign of this deal. But this is sort of a, you know, we're taking advantage of a situation, bringing in a player who, who could be really good for us and could get us through some games in the summer. The question is going to be what happens when he's gone. Um, and I think that's going to be the ultimate the ultimate question. Uh, and I'll be curious to see what how this impacts Ravel Morrison. I, I think... I have to feel we're going to if, if we sign him and we get him for super cheap and we can keep it under the cap. Um, I keep wondering when that buyout or mutual termination of contract comes for for Ravel Morrison. So far, it hasn't happened yet. When um, he gets a when he gets an interested party in him, so he's he's right now training with the Jamaican national team. So hope that he scores thirty seven goals yeah. uh, in their next game. That's what you got to hope for, because uh, otherwise, I don't I don't know that it's I don't know they're going to get bailed out like we're bailing out Nottingham Forest right now. Yeah, basically. <laughs> Uh, but Lewis O'Brien coming in here, he, he will stay through the summer. I think July 1st, I, the, the date was not specific in golf's article. He plays uh, kind of a similar, maybe a little bit more of an eight role to Matias click from what I, from what I look at, he's kind of a more linking type player. Uh, but he apparently the, the loan is just through the summer and then there's an option to extend. The question is if he's bad, he goes back. Like if he's bad, he goes back. No question. He goes back July 1st figure it out. Hopefully, hopefully they scout it. They have some other players, some other players in the chamber that they can, you know, pull the trigger on and, and grab. Um, what are your thoughts on the move? Do you like it? Are you yeah, a little tepid on it? I'm, I'm broadly indifferent to it. Uh, I think that there's no chance that he stays. Um, for, do, unless you, do, he, you, do you think he stays? Do you think there's no chance he stays through the summer or through the whole year? No, I think July 1st, they're going to bring him back. I think that they wanted him at a championship level with Blackburn, uh, unless unless it, things are humming here and he's starting every week, um, then there's a chance maybe they keep. They're they're not going to do any of that. that inconveniences their team in the slightest. So if he's killing it, they're going to want him back. If he's not killing it, they're going to want him back and send him somewhere else that they think is a better fit. So I think that there's no real there's no real version of this where we extend the loan. There's no version of this where we pay ten million dollars. There were some people talking about like, what if we paid the fee? That is not going to no. happen. That is zero percent. <laughs> Zero percent going to happen. There is a small probability, I would say, where there's a, you know, he really likes it. He's really clicking with Wayne Rooney, and he's playing even better than he thought that he could play. But still, Nottingham Forest maybe Nottingham Forest gets relegated, and I don't know. That, that's more about asset management. There was he played uh, thirteen. He had thirteen appearances in the Premier League this season before January, before they tried to loan him out. Uh, 580 minutes. I don't see how many starts. I don't have that number in front of me. One goal. He he was not. He was a player with a lot of talent, and obviously, like you said, they paid a good transfer fee from him uh, on their on their promotion year. It's, it just does not feel like this is something that's going to benefit DC United long term. This is like when LAFC got Gareth Bale for like three months, and then he won the championship and left. Except for the time, the timeline's <laughs> different. So we we needed a body. We don't really need a body in this spot. That's the. Cha- I wish yeah. this was a striker. I wish this was a center back. Um, it's not. I think Russell Canals is going to sit on an ice cube for for three months while 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 Lewis comes over here and takes his spot if he's as good as is advertised. 
And then in July, when he goes, all right, well, we've got depth, so we're fine. We'll have to maybe look, maybe look somewhere else if we want to strengthen it. That's that's my gut read on this without having seen the player or heard from any of the team officials about what their vision is for this. Yeah, I, I think I think you might be right. If he if he absolutely blows it up and has an MVP caliber year, I think there's a very good chance he goes back. And then they're like, all right, we, we want to make you part of our part of our team for the premiership. We, we think you're you know, you, you've graduated, so to speak, uh, if he or they loan him out to a championship side, which is also a possibility. Though I think, I think he might be. There are restrictions on FIFA on like when you can sign and be loaned and how often that can happen. There might be an opportunity that he can't then be loaned back. So he either plays for Nottingham Forest or can't. I have to go back and look. I'm not sure what the what the. They're comment. also they're also only two points clear of the relegation zone right now. Yeah. So, I, so something to keep in mind. Yeah. So I mean, I think I think I think if, if I think this might actually be a case of if Nottingham Forest stay up then I think there's a chance we might keep him for the year. If they go yep. back down, I think there's a very, very good chance that he comes back and he, and he plays plays for Nottingham Forest, so they try to go back up. So, uh, uh, but then he's, on a, then he's on a potentially on Premier League wages. I don't know what his <laughs> wage contract. Um, if, if, he, if they signed a contract that had sort of, and I would imagine if you're Forrest coming up to the Prem for the first time in quite a while, you're not signing anybody without having that sort of de-escalator clause if you go back down the championship they, you wouldn't do that so i'm sure that i'm sure they have a way to keep him under their salary they're, they're sort of where they want to be if they get relegated yeah. again hopefully they don't because there's a lot of i know i have a i have a close family friend that's a forest fan so i, wanna, I don't want to make him sad <laughs> also ben olsen so we've got you know double reasons to care about that exactly um yeah i i think i think there's a non-zero chance he stays for the year. I don't think there's no chance he, he signs. Non-zero chance he stays for the year. I'd say the more likely scenario is is you are right. Um, and I said the team Thank is you. scouting because he's taking up a uh, an international slot. And he will be taking up maybe a TAM deal. I don't know. I think it's going to depend on how that would that, how, how that wage fee is. Um, and maybe there might be there might be terms of that contract. If they extend him, maybe they have to pay him more. They have to pay more of the wages. Could, could see something like that. Um, but we'll see. He's apparently had a medical. It's gone a little bit quiet. So hopefully there's, this is not a, um, not where's a the shirt hashtag. Where's the shirt? Yeah, where's the shirt? So he's <laughs> holding up the shirt. Nothing will happen. So we'll, we'll see what happens. I think he gets an opportunity to play in a Rooney. Uh, maybe Rooney takes over Nottingham Forest if they do drop down. I could see that happening. There you I go. See that. Let's think about that. that will be hilarious. Like not only do we lose the player, but we lose the player. They're going to bring us both. Up. They're going to take them both. Yeah, maybe, uh, maybe. All right. Uh, we got some news here. That's a couple things I, I want to touch on. Let's, uh, let's, well, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna actually I'm gonna switch the order I had around. Let's talk about um, U.S. Open Cup broadcast. This is, we're, we're leaving the spicy meatball for the end. We're, huh? we're leaving the spicy meatball for the end. I think we want to finish on a strong note for this show. Um, That's a good idea. <laughs> so there was finally announced. I think it was all kind of speculative, and I was very nervous because I was like, I haven't heard any announcements about the U.S. Open Cup, and I'm I'm a big Open Cup fan. I think you are as well. Both are yep. big Open Cup fan. They finally announced it. They have the uh, the uh, the sort of the first two rounds, the third round. They're going to kind of wait and see. I, I hope that it, I'm hopeful that that will be a more, I, I just can't imagine them. I just can't imagine us soccer leaving out, but the MLS teams are going to be your big draw for this tournament. I can, I can, I I know why it's happening, but I'm a little bit, I'm sad, I guess at, at, at what's going on here. So if you, if, if you've been following the open cup, the past two seasons, obviously the COVID year was a weird year. I think that it was been canceled really not the past two years, the past two instances of the open cup, because it was canceled in 2020 and canceled in 2021. But they uh, they had a broadcast deal with ESPN and they broadcasted almost every game. Um, I think even the games that for the first round that weren't on ESPN were on YouTube. Um, this is a different scenario. Obviously, Turner, uh, we've talked about this. Um, Turner has the rights or sorry, uh, not Turner. Um, Warner Brothers has the rights to this year. So uh, Warner, HBO Max, Disney, whatever they want to whatever we want to call it. Uh, they have the rights and they are apparently putting these on YouTube, but they are only putting select games. Um, And I think while it is good that it's free, it's not behind a paywall, even though I think most soccer fans had access to ESPN plus um, it is very disappointing that it is just a limited set of games. And I will state it's disappointing because I, I love the open cup. I think this is a, a sleeping giant. Um, We don't have promotion relegation. So the only competition where we have to get to see these leagues sort of go at it is the open cup. Um, And I think personally, if U.S. soccer puts the investment into it, it could become a big sort of national tournament where you have these lower lower sides uh, taking taking flight. Are you are you just dis- as disappointed I am with the broadcast deal that you're not going to see you know the Dallas Defeaters 
play. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the problem is that I think you got to be realistic about the number of people watching that, right? It was like 450 people probably. Me and you and 300 and 448 of our closest friends. Uh, you know, I watched a lot of World Baseball Classic on Tubi, which is a thing I didn't know existed until this week. Like there's got, I mean, I don't know. Uh, the, we know where the rights holders were and, and that, that, that dictates a lot of this, but um, there are better places for it to be, but we've, you know, there's no prestige to this tournament mm-hmm. outside of the super fans. We continue to believe in its capabilities to be a vehicle to like, particularly the Euro, the Eurocentric fan, the fan that loves the cup for some reason, even though they're American, uh, you know, there's just lots of things about it that are, that are quintessentially romantic that should someone that was really interested in like just storytelling, they could take advantage of it, but that's just never been that way. I don't know. Clearly uh, it's like a chicken or the egg situation. If a lot more people tuned in, there would be a lot more impetus in someone paying for the rights and doing a better job, taking care of it yet. It's, it's hard. It's, it's, you need like a benevolent builder who is fine having us be a loss leader. And then, like, I'm going to make a a uh, drive to survive esque thing about lower league teams making it work. We'd watch it, but oh, Ted, yeah. we were always going to watch it. I mean, <laughs> gotta it, find, it's got to be other people. I mean, yeah, I mean, it is one thing I I could see if someone put in the effort to go to some of these. Like, I mean, just uh, and I think you would need the the problem with this is like drive to survive can invent stories. MLS could invent stories. You know, they've got these teams. They know the kind of storylines they want to do. This one would need it would need a Christos FC making a run to the quarterfinals to really put together. It doesn't even need that. I think yeah. you have you have these ethnic you have these ethnic teams mm-hmm. that have that are like 75 years in the making where your your grandson's playing for the same team your grandfather played in a hometown. That's true. You have guys that are trying that are having to take off work as welders and like and, and like string together the ability to get on a bus and go play an away game in the first round there i mean it, you you'd have to spend the money to do it but there's humans all up and down the early stages of this tournament i think it's easy i think it's just yeah. a matter of money yeah and, and you know to to us soccer's credit they spent the money to they were they were the ones producing these broadcasts and you know I, i'm hopeful the third round will be full on either hbo max or on YouTube, it looks like maybe it's going to be more re- re- uh, relegated to YouTube. I hope the final is like on TNT. Um, you know, I, I still think this tournament has something to say, and I'm just a little bit disappointed about that. I won't get to see all the matches because it was kind of fun watching some of these some of these like really small clubs try to play. Um, I think they did highlight the right games. I think it's very clear they went after the Goliath Giants versus. Uh, the Goliath versus David type of story. I know the kickers are going to be featured because they have they will they were guaranteed a either the um, Lionbridge FC, which play at your I'm the moderate CNU, which could, right. which could be a fun one. I think producer Brian lives out in the area. That's going to be televised. They're going to have a. They're going to. Oh, yeah, that's going to be that's one of the YouTube games uh, that they are. So that'll be that'll be fun to watch. Producer Brian and I with his new baby will have to scoot over there. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. It's going to be that's going to be a city scene. That'll be fun to watch. I'm, I think a lot of a lot of kickers fans are rooting for Lion Bridge. Um, I think they it's they have sort of uh, a lot of kickers uh, fans have gone down there for Lion Bridge. So it's very much kind of a uh, brother, big brother, little brother type of uh, type of not rivalry but sort of com- um uh companionship com- camaraderie i can't even talk right now but uh yeah camaraderie, camaraderie I, yes. I, I, you know i, I want to keep harping on this like think about all right well i was gonna say think about what makes uh the wrexham show a hit and i think you have to you have to take with a very giant grain of salt it's the celebrities that are a part of this yeah now that that is a made that is a major major part of it okay putting that to the side like that, that even the thing you're talking about about these groups of people who could f- follow any team, uh, they could be they could be super fans of Chelsea and they can live in Newport News, and you know you, lots of people do that. But there's also a lot of people, or are there are a small number of people that are doing other things on their weekends. They're going out to these to the attendance 900 Lions Bridge versus whoever the hell like no, Newport News FC. Apprentice <laughs> School, right? Like uh, guys that are you know. Never going to make it in the pros, but that's where people are using to spend their time, which is even more valuable than the money. The tickets are cheap, but they're spending their time because they can't be anywhere else and doing anything else while they're there. So that's a sacrifice that people are choosing to make. And I think that there, it's just someone pay me to be able to, I'll go to school and figure out how to make documentaries. But from a, from a storytelling perspective, it seems like 
the like the the easiest bowling strike in the universe. Like I, the bumpers are up, and it, it's a, and it just seems so easy to, to tell that story, and it's just not a priority for anybody. And I'm sorry, it just bothers yeah. me. It just seems so easy. Yeah. It's like it's right there. And, and to the credit, I think if I recall, in like the 2019, I guess it was sort of the last non COVID year they had like certain like features that would play during like commercial breaks yeah. or would play during, you know, in, in sort of in between sort of the analysis and things like that, that had sort of featured some of these teams. Um, I, I mean, I think, I think it could be a, it could be a cool story. It could be something that could attract, attract soccer fans. Um, I, you know, I'd love to see him do it. Um, even if it's just for just us and a 400 people that are interested, but, um, yeah, I'll pay for it too. Yeah. Like if you want, like if you would like me to fund your Kickstarter, whatever company this is, RFK Refugees will be a proud contributor to your Kickstarter. Yeah, and I think you know when, when we're talking about, you know, we talk about pro rail in this country, and we talk about how it doesn't exist. You know, you talk about the FA Cup. The FA Cup's importance in England is very, very much down, and there's no secret and coincides with the growth of the Premier League. Like the Premier League has basically sucked up all the attention in England and, and the idea of, you know, if, if you ask fans in the championship, if you ask fans in the league one, league two, which would you rather do? Would you rather make the premiership or would you rather win the FA cup? I think most fans would say, I'd, I'd want, I want my team in the premiership. I want to make the, the highest, yeah. you know, and, and that probably wasn't the case, you know, 20, 30 years ago that, that the FA cup was a big deal. We don't have promotion and relegation here. And so I, I just feel like this tournament could be a, a, a mechanism by which you can kind of, if you could really go in and say, you know what, we are going to attach some serious cash. Like we're, we're talking like 10 million for the 10, winner. 10 million. I was just about to say $10 million, 5 yeah. million for the runner up. And then, you know what? Not, not just each round you make it, the values go up to where like you make it to the semifinals, you get a million, you make it to the final, you get 5 million plus the extra five. I mean, you start attaching some serious money into this. And you could talk Sponsored by Ford. Every player gets a Mustang. And you could talk about lower division <laughs> sides saying, let's go out. Let's find a good team. Let's make if we make a cup run. You know, this could be something that could fund our team for the rest of the year. It could allow us to expand our facilities. It could allow us to get an owner interested enough to come in and invest and give us money that we could go get a new stadium. It could be really big, something big. If if U.S. soccer starts out by putting the money in front of it. And the financials could make you talk about that documentary, like the financials. You have this lowered, maybe this like adult league team goes in and makes it makes a, a dream run to the quarterfinals and gets two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Like talk about a boon for like some of those smaller clubs. So I, yep. I think I think that that could really be something that could attach sort of the money aspect to it. Um, could be something good. All right, let's get into the wild spicy meatball. <laughs> spicy meatball, the wild and crazy of U.S. soccer. Um, I had almost forgotten about this story. Like this, like all the MLS season starting, the club soccer starting. This, this, um, it completely removed from my mind. And U.S. soccer, very happy to hear you. Yeah, say I'm sure that they too. are. I'm sure they are. <laughs> but I mean, it's. I mean, this been been a lot of news. Um, U.S. Uh-huh. soccer finally dropping. They had sort of started this investigation dealing with Rosalind Berhalter, Greg Berhalter, an altercation in 1992. There is the the Reinas who kind of started this, and um, the report came out and. I don't want to minimize. I don't want to minimize. I guess when the, when the report came out, you know, I think we kind of knew that, you know, Greg and Rosalind uh, Berhalter had very much moved on. You know, they had this, this was a something that happened 30 years ago. And I, I feel so, so sad mostly for Rosalind to have this kind of just drudged up again, something you thought was dead and buried, you know, only a select few people know. And you would never think like your best friends from, you know, 30 years ago would use this on you. Um, so I feel so sorry for her. You know, I think the report comes out. I think it makes obviously do not want to minimize like the what Greg did was very, very wrong, was very much domestic abuse. But the report comes out and says he took ownership of it. He made steps to change it. And, you know, I I think his reaction to this situation, I I won't say what happened makes him look good because it's never good to have that thing happen to him. But I think his response and how he very clearly grew as a person and said, I want to be better. You know, he, full disclosure with his coaches, he didn't try to hide anything. He really came out and faced it openly. Um, and I think, honestly, I think he he responded very well. And I think he came off, I think he comes off this report. I think there are any concerns about whether any team would take a chance on them. I think this this should, 
in my mind, spell it as just something. This is something from his past. He's not hiding what happened in his past, but it's certainly not something that's a part of his present. Any, any, am I, am I, am I making a mistake there or do, or do you come down sort of on the same side there? No, I mean, I, I think that part's been litigated for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was, that part has been litigated uh, 30 years ago, yeah. in fact. And, and, and the, and the, and the participants on both sides have, Made their peace with it. Made no police report. It wasn't hidden. That is the that is the smallest piece of this puzzle because of the way everything turned out. But what we found out today, so we knew we knew a lot of this, right? We knew all all that stuff. The reporting to that point had been apparent. What we didn't know is what was actually said. What was actually the behavior of the Reinas in the in the run up to the tournament at the tournament and everything that came out today has them looking. Completely unhinged yeah. to me, just like the wildest version of out of control soccer parent as a professional adult uh, that you'll ever come across. And you know, I I think we, let's let's talk about sort of the the way that happened. I think you and I have a bit of a different uh, perspective on maybe not on who's to blame, but even like the well, apportionment of blame on the on the U.S. soccer side. I I, I don't I, yeah, and I want to clarify. I think I got. I got called out a little bit for, I guess, uh, from somebody from a statement I made. I want to make make sure very clear. Like the the, the Reinas are absolutely the front center. They are absolutely the way they behaved was unethical, um, inappropriate. Like just the way that this came about, it's so clearly it, it was so clearly an attempt. It, it's uh, I can't even think of of Claudio's wife right now. I can't think of her name. Um, her but, name is uh, Danielle. Danielle. The way Danielle Danielle Reyna very much walked a very walked right up to almost blackmail and almost seemed to be threatening to release this story. Her her comments about how like oh I I can do one interview and I can bury this guy like I can He's, absolutely do the it. exact quote was like uh his like was a, his his sneakers will be him and his dumb sneakers will be will be out of here forever and his floor passes. Yeah, and like. It's- <sighs> Yeah, it's 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 honestly cra- it's honestly crazy, and, and the report makes mention that the Reinas were just not forthcoming on this, and and Claudio as well, his behavior was entirely inappropriate, and, and the fact that this, and, and we'll get into where I come in as sort of a is sort of being critical here, um, is this apparently has been a constant thing since 2016, since Claudio Reina was a youth player. I don't want to. I don't want to hog the hog the mic here too much, John. Like any like any other yeah. thoughts you have on this? And I mean, Claudio saying like, "Oh, this game is not being taken serious." There's a woman ref out oh there. <laughs> this this can't be serious. Whoa. Like everything that came out, everything that came out made this man look tiny and, and, and ridiculous. And you know, every single parent of of the players wanted their kids to play. Like, yeah, like every team you've ever been a part of. That's the way it goes. Should you have been playing more? Maybe it, but it doesn't matter. Like you can't change. You cannot change this through any means, but particularly blackmail. I am glad, by the way, Claudia Reyna's uh, agent, the, the, sorry, the Reyna's agent, I guess their family has an agent, Mm -hmm. uh, sort of says uh, the Reyna's are kind and generous people who have devoted countless hours and energy to promoting U.S. soccer, uh, blah, blah, blah. Gio acknowledges that like countless players before he showed too much disappointment when not to play. That's only part of the story here. And yeah, the only nobody's part of the story. That- like, I hate that statement because nobody's talking. This is not about Gio. Like, nope. w- we know the situation with Gio. We know how the team moves past it. Like, if if they do not do what they did, I guarantee you no one talks about this anymore. Nope. I, I, this all feels like an attempt to, to get, Greg Berhalter and, and you know what the, the sad the, I mean the maybe the saddest aspect the sad aspect of this is that it might work I, I do not know how you can move forward with with Greg Berhalter as coach uh, even with this I, I think he should I, get an opportunity elsewhere but I'm not I'm, I'm spi- not, I spitefully want him to which yeah, is not the no. which is not the reason you choose a coach for certain but the the rest the rest of the statement says this is only a part of the story but the only side of the story the insiders chose to tell it is disheartening and grossly unfair to see the family turned into a one-dimensional characters to progress a narrative that benefits others who does this benefit exactly does it benefit Greg the guy that they're not going to hire why would they care about that does it benefit US soccer to have this stuff dragged out and and to your point show that they tolerated his presence around them because of his storied career. They tolerated this man's 
grossly inappropriate behavior for six years or five years or however long it's mm-hmm. been. Uh, no, like no one benefits from this at all. It was a, it was a, so I think that they are wildly out of pocket. I think that they need to never be around the team again. I think they never need to be allowed in the friends and family section. Again, they could buy the cheap seats if they want to see their son play. Uh, but it is, it is absurd. And I think that it's good that there has been a cleaning of house since then. Mm-hmm. I, by the of of the people that have gone, I think that you know the only person I'm like spitefully wishing to see not be dragged down by this way is Greg. But I think Greg will find something else. He may be, yeah. you know, it, it's it's fine to move on from a from a coach after after a cycle. But it's just so I don't know. It was it was maddening. Everybody I know that read this was just like, man, f f Claudia Arena and his wife. Yeah, <laughs> these people are awful. And, and you know, we do need to mention. You know, I think what has been brought up is, you know. It, the protection they feel they need to apply to geo is it coming from the fact they lost their i think their eldest their first son to to cancer um and that you know that's that's trauma and that certainly has an impact um i think it is you know worthy to to mention that as maybe something that might be driving this i don't think it's an excuse they're still adults they still chose to act this way and you know, and, and we get into, I guess, you know, one aspect that I don't think should be lost is is Ernie Stewart and, and Brian McBride's role in this. And I'm not I'm not blaming them or assigning any part of the blame, any part of the blame for them. But I think it's worth asking them if this was, you know, if this was Christian Pulisic's mom and dad, would they have would they have interacted with? With him the same way, absolutely not. If Christian wasn't getting the playing time, maybe there would be some smites in the media. But no way would you have Christian's dad calling up, you know, Ernie Stewart. Maybe he's met him a couple of times, but you know, it's very. He didn't play with him. He didn't play. He didn't play on the U.S. national team. With yeah, him. certainly. And that's and that's what we're getting at. It's you know, these Claudia Arena was teammates with Greg Berhalter, was teammates with Ernie Stewart, with Brian McBride. These are guys that they know. He, he knows very well, and he used that friendship and exploited that friendship to try to uh, force a manager's hand with, with their son. And and it's, it's the beyond inappropriateness is that they allowed it, I guess, to continue. And, you know, maybe there was a point It's what, you know, we don't know. Maybe there was a point when, you know, Claudia Arena and Brian McBride said enough of this, like, you got to stop. Like, this is inappropriate. Like, you know, no other parent would come up to this. And, you know, but I think what maybe supports my aspect of this is that I think Brian McBride sat down with the Reinas and said, I wouldn't do this for any other family, but, you know, I know the Reinas and I decided to sit down with them. And to me, that just that just speaks to just gross. I mean, it it speaks to just like there was no like, look, you like you like no shutdown. Like, we're not going to talk about Geo's playing time. Like, he's a grown man. He can he can prove it out on the field. You know, we can talk, you know, we'll, we'll look at maybe seeing whether that impacts us and whether we hire a new coach. He's a very talented player, but you got to stop. And I think that is worthy criticism that Ernie Stewart and Brian McBride maybe allowed this to fester where they where the rain has felt they had the power to impact roster decisions as parents. And, you know, we see and people have talked about people have talked about all the time. You, have, you soccer coaches that said, I've dealt with a similar situation like this with a parent. You know, so it's 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 funny to see it sort of on such a large scale. I think there's worthy criticism and questions for Ernie Stewart. Why did you allow this to happen? Why did you allow this to grow so much? Like you could have put a stop to it. You could have said, "I'm not paying attention." You know, I think Ernie Stewart behaved the right way when he heard the news. You know, there's a lot of attention about abuse in U.S. soccer, and I think he absolutely couldn't just say, "Well, that was 30 years ago. He's married to Rosalind." Okay. It's all good. It's the one time he acted quickly. Yeah, it's the exactly. one time. It's the one time decisively in this, and it was because of what has been happening previously, like you said. But I, you know, it, I, I'm reading. I'm reading as some of us were talking here. Like mm-hmm. Ernie Stewart was concerned with Gio's behavior during the thing. There's contemporary text messages as as Claudio is going off. Like this guy is insane. Like mm-hmm. I have never in 20 years in this business, I've never had these conversations with another player's parents. So they were like sort of incredulous about it. I think that they are. Uh, the thing I wonder here is what do they think is what do they have to lose? Did they think Gio Reyna was like, you know what? I'm not going to play anymore. Well, you think that they think that was going to happen if they were mean to his dad? Clearly not. That was not going to happen. So what do they have to lose? Was it was it personal relationships with a legendary U.S. player? I guess. But if he is using that relationship to trade on 
inappropriate comments on trying to manipulate and also to denigrate U.S. soccer. And this, he's talking about the fact that Gio Reyna should have had first class travel assignments and be treated better than the other U17 players because he's better than them. Um, just uh, it, it, it was a no win situation from the, from the context of like clearly he is a historic player in U.S. soccer history. Uh, and, and you want to treat him with respect also due to your relationship with him individually. But I think from a cost perspective, Gio wasn't going to go away. You needed Gio. You, you know that Gio is going to be a part of this future. He's, he, if, he, if, if, if Gio Reyna wasn't this player, then they probably would have told Claudio to go pound sand. Like if he wasn't a player that it has the ability, a generational talent and kind of already is considering how he's playing. But uh, I, I just I just think if you had to apportion the blame, just to sort of close this up, Ted, as far as the Ernie Stewart versus the Reynas, what would if you had to pie chart it, wh- who would who would you say is more at fault in this in this situation? Well, and and here's I, I guess here here's another here's another consideration when it comes to Claudio is that you know he was sporting director at NYCFC and he was also sporting director at Austin. So there is there, the keyword. <laughs> what's that? Was being the keyword after was, all of this was, but at the time, and so I I can understand you know the sporting director at us soccer does have to maintain a mm-hmm. relationship with, uh, with Claudia Reyna. I, I just think, you know, and I think maybe that played a role in it. You know, he doesn't want Claudio saying, well, you know, Hey, this wonder kid we have at Austin or this wonder kid we have at NYCFC, I'm not going to release him for youth camps. You know, I'm not going to release him for, for youth games because of your treatment. It would be really petty of him, but based on what we've seen on the, from the comments, honestly, wouldn't put it past him to do that. So maybe that played a little bit of a role. So, I mean, again, I'm, I'm 100% on the blame being the Reynas. I just think there are legitimate questions you can ask about the relationship. And, I mean, it did prompt U.S. soccer to establish very firm you know, guidelines, which – I think Charlie Bohm pointed out, like, how did this not exist in the first place? Like, you would think there would be pretty clear guidelines established. But I, I think U.S. soccer is in a new era that we have, you know, a challenge uh, national team players, you know, that played for the national team in the 90s now have kids who are also good at soccer and are making national team appearances. We just had a Josh Wolf's son score a absolute Galazzo. So this is not a problem that's going to, I think this is something that's not going to go away. So I think us soccer was like, all right, we're not doing this again. We're going to have guys. Ban all dads. So I do, I, I think they could have been, I think they could have been maybe a little proactive, but again, I understand because this is, this is very much uncharted territory. I was just thinking, like, could you imagine like George Weah coming and trying to talk to Ernie Stewart? Yeah. As president the president of, of a country. <laughs> Like, now yeah. that's a guy you got to kind of listen to. I feel like more than <laughs> the, the 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 general man, the technical director of Austin FC. Yeah, but you would just never, you would never see it. And again, so again, speak to that. Uh, any any other final thoughts you want to have on this, or should we wrap it up? Nope, just uh, kick rocks, Claudia Reyna and your wife. Yep. All right, folks, that's going to do it. Again, twittercom slash refugees. Follow us on Twitter. Patreon.com. So sorry Patreon. to the live. Sorry to the live folks. Show. Yeah, sorry. The live show folks. Sorry for the live show. A little bit, a little bit of a rough showing. Go ahead. Also, sorry to those of you who are listening to on podcast because the first half of this podcast is going to sound like I'm whispering to you uh, through a seashell, and then it'll get better. <laughs> so, so stick with us, folks. It's yeah. worth it. Yeah. All right, folks. That's going to do it. Thank you guys so much for listening. We'll catch you guys next week. Vamos. Vamos. <laughs>